Um, hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Um, today we are here with Dr. Richard Bowles. Um, my name is Kimberly Ruckman, and I'm a representative for NeuroNeeds. And today we are talking about chronic fatigue syndrome and testing and natural treatment options. Um, so I will let Dr. Richard Bowles um, begin his presentation and you can type in any questions that you have in the chat and we will answer them towards the end. So stay tuned for that. Take it away, Dr. Bowles. <laughs> okay. Um, we've noticed that there's slightly different titles for this talk, but they're all relatively similar. Um, so I'm going to be talking about chronic fatigue syndrome and how that can be how DNA testing can help you to make a diagnosis and to determine the right treatment, and also in particular on how natural or dietary supplements can help also with chronic fatigue. And I'm gonna be giving a lot of examples from my own patients. Um, I have quite a few patients with chronic fatigue. Um, actually, I would say over half my patients have chronic fatigue, and a fair portion of them have fatigue bad enough to have the diagnosis of chronic fatigue syndrome, and we'll get to that. Um, the slide that you're seeing right now is a snapshot um, below the, the title on the very top there is a snapshot of the website, the NeuroNeeds website. And you can see under the tree there, you can see is this neuroneeds.com. Um, and, and then there's the on conditions. Um, chronic fatigue is one of the conditions. And then it goes to the fatigue landing page. And then below that, you can see it's just a snapshot of that. And I wanted to highlight that for a few reasons. Number one, because I spent you know, hundreds of hours, I think, to do thousands of pages to put all the stuff together on the website. I think it's a really good reference for many different things. But also, if you have any questions about things like, oh, is that real? What's the, is Dr. Bowles just saying that? Or is there any evidence behind it? It's on the page. It's the, the, um, you'll see the PMID, which is the PubMed identification numbers on the slides, but the actual numbers are on the page and there's, you can just click it and on the page and you can get to the various um, areas and to see um, in detail or if you want to see it again or if you want to spend more time reading something or if you just want to make sure that what I'm saying is correct and that what's the evidence behind it, it's all there on the website. So what I'll do is I'll get started. Um, I'll start with a, a case report because these are all my patients and these are all real people and they're all people that I'm still following. Um, it's a 13 year old girl. Um, her three major complaints when she first saw me was some um, fatigue, um, including exercise intolerance. She had chronic pain. You can see it's in different places, had abdomen and extremities, and then she had a lot of GI symptoms, including a poor appetite. And these problems were essentially bad enough that she was disabled and unable really to do school. She had a whole lot of diagnosis, as you can see, migraine, gastroparesis, irritable bowel, POTS, seizures, ADHD, learning disabilities, anxiety. And you notice that these are all descriptions. Um, it's not that she doesn't have them because she fit the descriptions, but they're all descriptions of things that are bothering her. They're not underlying biochemical molecular biological changes. She had other issues, fevers for no unknown reason, many different infections, problems with sleep. Parasomia would be like sleepwalking, sleep talking, night terror, something like that. Depression, having to get up multiple times at night and during the day to urinate, and palpitations where you can feel your heart beating really fast. Um, fatigue, because of that, she was only in part-time school, unable to participate in sports and she had post-exertional fatigue. If she overdid it, she would pay for it the next day, maybe only half a day, maybe two weeks. Usually it was several days that she overdid it. So she really was very um, limited and disabled in what she can do because if she did even a little bit too much, it would at least be a couple, a day or so that she would be fatigued and in bed. But the worst part of it were the episodes. The episodes would last four to seven days each. They would come for no known reason. They didn't know when they were gonna come or why they would come. The weakness included, um, the, she'd have muscle weakness, ataxia, that's the way that a baby or a drunk would walk, balance problems and lethargy, really, really tired and out of it. And then during these episodes, she was bedridden, um, unable to do homework, unable to do, really do anything. So these were really, this her condition was disabling. 
Um, MitoSwab, um, that's done by a company called Reliagen. If you just look at MitoSwab, I order that a lot of times for my patients. It showed mitochondrial dysfunction. Citrate synthase was elevated. That means that there's a whole lot of mitochondria. If the mitochondria aren't working very well, one of the things they do is they proliferate or they make more of them to try to make up for the problem. And complex one the, um, in the respiratory chain was decreased. And this is what I call the usual profile. This combination I see very frequently in um, chronic fatigue syndrome. And I'll show you some data on that. Um, but I wanted to highlight these episodes again. These episodes are really a key as to what's going on here. Um, DNA sequencing, and they sequenced all of her DNA, um, found in the calcium channel, CA for calcium channel, A1S, found this mutation, asparagine to histidine in amino acids 649. And it's rare, two in 10,000 people have it. Um, highly concerned, that means you can look at all different vertebrates, fish, frogs, birds, whatever, and they all have exactly the same amino acid in that location. But my patient did not, and it suggests that that might not be tolerated in that position. And computer programs suggested it was also a problem. This gene encodes a calcium channel in the muscle, which can cause periodic paralysis, um, which really kind of fits this very well. Um, it also can cause, in my patients that have mutations in this calcium channel gene, often have fatigue, pain, and anxiety. Um, she was treated on that with, um, the pain got better on quite low doses of amitriptyline. The dizziness improved greatly. Um, and she still has so severe, she still has fatigue, but it's much better. The ADHD complaints are actually her chief complaint. Um, on, in particular, on mitochondrial-related therapy, her fatigue has improved quite a bit. So she went from being essentially disabled to, for the most part, participating in school full-time and being almost a normal girl. So if you haven't seen um, this before, this is I do different things. I'm a clinician. I see patients. That's really my day job. Um, I have my own private practice in Pasadena that I use Zoom, um, but I also the director of a of a um, neurogenomics program that is a neurology practice, neuroabilities that's based in the Philadelphia area, but we do telemedicine nationwide and also around the world as well. Um, so I, most of what I do is I see patients. I'm coming to you today from the, as the medical and scientific officer of NeuroNeeds, a company that makes the, the products, and we're gonna talk about some of those. Um, I've also have been involved in DNA sequencing and at least four different companies that did that, including Cortigen for five years. And I do research. In fact, I'm going to show you some research in a few of the slides that are done. Um, everyone knows what fatigue is, right? It's being tired. But, you know, why do we feel tired? Well, the animal or the human feels tired, so it'll crawl in a little ball under a rock and, and heal. Any disease will make you tired. It's on purpose to try to take the energy and to switch it over to healing instead of to finding food or a mate or something else. So chronic illness, almost any chronic illness leads to chronic fatigue. Chronic means it's ongoing over a long period of time. It doesn't really matter what it is. So when I talk about chronic fatigue, aren't I talking about pretty much all illnesses? Well, there's a condition called myalgic encephalomyelitis or chronic fatigue syndrome. And this condition is, yes, almost every chronic condition has chronic fatigue, but it's different in that the, the fatigue is overwhelming, um, can lead to various degrees of disability, um, which can be full disability in a lot of cases. Um, and the patient that I showed you had overwhelming fatigue, at least during the episodes. It's post-exertional. If you exert too much, and too much can be just getting up to go to the restroom as someone who's really sick, um, you will pay for it the next day with more symptoms, including more fatigue. So it's not just you pay for it afterwards or an hour later or so. It's the next day that makes it post-exertional. And non-refreshed. In most types of fatigue, you wake up feeling pretty okay, and then the day wears you down. It may, you, may, you may wear down very quickly during the day in some diseases. But in chronic fatigue syndrome, you wake up tired, and you remain tired all day long. You, you don't wake up. Sleep does not refresh the situation. So these are the three things that are different. And I know that there's different names for the syndrome in the United States. It's often called chronic fatigue syndrome. Um, in Britain, it's usually called myalgic encephalomyelitis. 
um, often today's that these abbreviations are put together and then this is what the it's associated with and this is what I'm going to call it for the rest so what we're talking about here is not just fatigue not just chronic fatigue but chronic fatigue that's overwhelming post-exertional and non-refresh the fatigue is both physical and mental mental fatigue is often referred to as brain fog and what do we mean by brain fog concentration memory and thinking are problems um, not everyone has all three of them. Some people will have two of those or something like that. When we talk about brain fog, they can't concentrate. Thinking to be like doing math problems or trying to plan out your day on um, poor memory. You can't remember, you know, what you did an hour ago or yesterday. Usually long-term memory is intact. Okay, so the chronic fatigue website of the CDC, the um, Center of Disease Controls in Atlanta, Georgia, um, I copied and, and pasted that from here because I thought that these were a really good idea as to really what it is and what does it do. Um, at some point you get it and you didn't have it before and you just are not able to function at your previous level. Um, it affects ability to do daily tasks like taking a shower, preparing a meal. I have patients that were so, that were so fatigued that just getting up to use the restroom or to to eat breakfast in bed it was overwhelmingly fatigued just from that. Um, that's obviously a much more severe case. <coughs> um, even in the mild cases, it makes it almost impossible to have a job or go to school at least full time. And there has to be a lot of accommodations. It can last for years and lead to severe dis um, disability. And many patients are housebound or even bedbound during their illness. This is not a rare condition. 90% of people that have this condition do not have a name for it and don't know why they have it. And it's believed that between one and three, a million Americans are affected with this disease. You probably know somebody with this. You may have it yourself or one of your family members, which is why you're talking to me now. Chronic fatigue syndrome, there's not a test for it. Um, it's just if you have fatigue that's chronic and Overwhelming post-exertional and non-refresh, then that's chronic fatigue syndrome or um, ME-CFS. And it doesn't really, the, the cause is what we're going to get to. So what else is common? I mean, when you say chronic fatigue syndrome, it really focuses on the fatigue. But when you say myalgic encephalomyelitis, it focuses on the pain. Um, pain is a big part of it. Where is the pain? Muscles and joint. Um, is the usual that can be in other places in fact chronic sore throat can be that as well tender lymph nodes there's many other things that can be um dizziness on standing or otherwise having pots or orthostatic and then sleep problems these are the three things pain orthostatics that means when you're standing up you're a bit dizzy or you're maybe more brain fog um, and sleep issues are the most common things other than fatigue um but there are many other functional disorders that can be with it. And you can see from this list here, um, many of them are more in the, considered in the mental realm. Others are more we consider in the physical realm. But these are all apps from problems with nerves. Nerves that go to different parts of the body that aren't working quite right, that do different things. And they all overlap. If you have any one of these conditions, you're more likely to have any of the other of the conditions. If you're wondering where this guy came from, if you recognize this is the Ventruvian man from Leonardo da Vinci, so it's almost 500 years old. Oops. Oops. Okay, so what causes it? Well, the short answer is that it's not known, but researchers and clinicians and have noticed that there is energy metabolism and immune system issues. When you do tests, you find problems with mitochondrial function and you find troubles with the immune system. And I wrote down some, what some of those issues are. And they're different in different people and most people have many different problems with their energy or mitochondrial metabolism and with their immune function. But those are the two things that you pretty much see in almost all cases, is you see problems with energy metabolism, which is saying mitochondrial dysfunction because the mitochondria make the energy. And there is a mitochondrion and this is a white blood cell, you see problems with the immune system. So I'm going to go into a little bit of my own data. Um, this is the machine. It's the size of two refrigerators. The part on the right is really the size of a refrigerator. This is a high seq 4000 from Illumina that can sequence the, all of the DNA 
three billion nucleotide pairs from mom, three billion from dad in about three hours per person. Um, it machine costs a million dollars. And um, the data you get is literally three billion base pairs um, on both alleles, and it's terabytes of information um, to go through. Literally, it fills an entire hard drive for, per person. The neurogenomic service that I've set up with Dr. Mark Minsk um, in the um, New Jersey is, again, it's worldwide um, that we do that, particularly all over the country, but have had mo multiple overseas um, clients. And this is to work with a physician. If the patient is in the United States, then the patient or the, the parent or both can be on the call. It's either a Zoom call or a Teams call at some tele, teleconference, discussing the patient, discussing the DNA, discussing treatment options. If the patient is physically outside of the United States, it's not legal for me to do that, and I discuss it directly with the physician. Physician is usually in the country that the patient is in. Um, so what, so the data from that service, um, at the time that I wrote this, which was in April of last year, there were 62 patients that had seen a full evaluation, including the entire genome was sequenced, not just all of the genes, but all of the area between the genes. When you do exome, um, you look at all of the genes, but when you do genome, you do all of the area between the genes, and 99% of the DNA is between the genes. So this is really the whole chromosomes, all the chromosomes in the mitochondrial DNA sequence. So there were 62 patients that had the whole chromosome sequenced, um, and of those, um, 18 of them had fatigue as the chief complaint. Either they came in because of fatigue or they came in for like fatigue and pain or something like that. It was one of the, of the two or three of the equally chief complaints that they came in with. So these are patients that, although they all have other things, they came in with fatigue. And yes, they all did have other things. These are all 18 unrelated individuals. I'm not talking about their, yeah, they have family members that also have fatigue, but I'm counting only each family. Um, the age range was from 5 to 38 years, but most of them were either teenagers or in their 20s. Um, they're slightly more females than males. Chronic fatigue syndrome is a little bit more common in females than males, but you see it in both. Um, of the 18, 16 of them made a diagnosis of ME-CFS based upon the CDC criteria. The other two, I think they have it, but I just didn't ask the right question. Like I didn't ask about orthostatics or I didn't ask about non-refreshed sleep or something like that. So I can't say they have it for sure, but it seems like they do. So this is really 18 patients with chronic fatigue syndrome or at least 16 of them for sure have that. All of the patients had GI problems. Um, you can see that the green means more than 50% or more of them had it. So of the 18, 14 had nausea or vomiting. That's gastroparesis, cyclic vomiting syndrome. If you just look at the green, so you can see irritable bowel syndrome, 12 out of 18, POTS or dizziness, 14 out of 18, headache, 14, limb pain, arms or legs, ADH, either ADD or ADHD, exactly half, Sleep issues, half. That's not something that people really talk about as much, but it's, it's one of the really common ones. Anxiety, a little bit more than half. And then the ones in blue here were between a third of the patients and half the patients. So they were common, but not the majority. Um, and you can see a lot of different things here, including the frequent urination the last patient had, frequent infections the last patient had that too. Um, autism, not that rare. A third of my patients have it, muscle weakness and depression. My patients are, tend to be more, because I'm a pediatrician, they tend to swing a little bit younger. Um, a chronic fatigue um, population tends to be more older and they'll probably have more autism, less autism and more adult-related things. But um, with the understanding that, you know, these are young people for the most part, um, that the, they all do have other things other than fatigue. Um, I know this is very complicated and I'm not showing this to try to understand what the genetics is, but I want you to understand is how frequently I can find a genetic abnormality. What we're talking about now are de novo variants. That means the father doesn't have it and the father really is daddy because we have the DNA. Um, the mother doesn't have it, but the child has it and it's been proven the child has it and it, there's no doubt that it's there, it's not a false positive. Um, 
of the 18 patients, six of them had a de novo variant that is considered pathogenic or likely pathogenic. Pathogenic means that variant causes disease. Likely pathogenic, it probably causes disease. So all of these variants, one can say that they are disease-causing, at least in part. Um, and they're in different genes. And the genes do different things you can see in, in green. And I'm going to put that together, because then you can read about it. This is mitochondria. And then this one here, this one here is mitochondria, and this one here is neurotransmitters, neurotransmitters. Um, again, neurotransmitters. You know, some of these things are what you'd expect, mitochondria. So these are pathogenic, likely pathogenic, but they were inherited. They come from one of the parents. Um, and then here's a, a channel gene, a deletion, including the gene that makes melatonin. Um, a, in a gene that, um, that is involved in repairing da um, damaged DNA, actually destroying damaged DNA so it won't cause mutations. Immune genes, collagen genes, you can see. So there were six in the last one that were de novo. There's six in this one. So basically there are 12 out of the 18 patients had a variant that was found on DNA that could say, well, this is extremely likely to, to be related to disease. Okay, clinical diagnostic variants. Half of them had one. These are variants that, they're missense variants. They change one amino acid to another, so you can't say for sure that it causes disease, and they're inherited from one of the parents. But what I can say is the patient has other issues, like the one that I showed you. There was a mutation in a gene that caused periodic paralysis, and the patient has periodic paralysis. So that genetic change can be said to be diagnostic. It causes the periodic paralysis. Can't prove that it causes the fatigue as well, but one can say that mutation is disease-related in that patient by virtue of the problems the patient has, not by virtue of the type of variant. Those are the ones we saw before. All of the ones in, in and, and then th this would be like this calcium channel causes hemiplegic migraine, and that patient has hemiplegic migraine. Um, this this one we're going to see this kid or later. Um, this this gene mutations and it causes an amplified pain syndrome, and the patient has an amplified pain syndrome. So these are all clinical variants. The patient meets that outside of fatigue. The ones in green are all channels, ion channels, and we'll talk about what those mean. And then the blue one here is an ion pump. It uses ATP to pump it instead of just a door that the salts go through. Ions are salts, channels are doors. So they're doors in the cell that the salts go through to come from one side to the other. Some salts go in, some salts go out. Depends on which one it is. Like sodium will go in and it's pumped out. Potassium goes out and it's pumped in. And then there are many other clinical variants. These are variants I think are likely related to disease, but I can't say for sure. So there's a whole bunch of variants. So you put it all together, um, Two-thirds of them had a pathogenic or likely pathogenic variant. That could be say that these are very likely to be disease-related. Half of them had a variant that the patient also has the clinical disease, like periodic paralysis. One of the two of them, and the, these are all called diagnostic variants. There were 21 diagnostic variants in 18 patients. Um, 16 out of the 18 patients, almost 90%, had at least one of them. Um, clinical variants, in addition to that, altogether 18 patients had 35 variants, which is just under two per patient, and that's a polygenic model. Most disease is not caused by a single mutation in a single gene, but predisposed by multiple polymorphisms, multiple variants, and multiple genes that then interact with the environment to develop disease. So this is what you'd expect. Most, almost all human diseases are polygenic, meaning more than one gene involved. So this is not unexpected. Um, so there were 16 that had a diagnostic variant. What about the other two? One of them had a clinical variant that I'm pretty sure is related because I treated it and the problem got much better. Um, and it, this, the RYR2 calcium channel really fit. And then the 18th patient, the last one, I, I didn't find anything. So the chance of finding something is as high as 95%. Um, in the 18 patients if you do whole genome. So that's pretty good. Um, I said that I'd get back to MitoSwab. Here's the, um, it's Reliagen, reliagendiagnosis.com. 
Um, this is saliva. It's collected by a swab sent by mail. Um, it measures the complexes of the mitochondria. Um, in, of the 18 patients here, nine of them had a mitoswab. Um, the mitoswab was abnormal in eight of the nine, and the ninth one was abnormal by the mitoswab plus. I recommend the mitoswab plus because it gives you additional information. Um, complex two and two plus three. So they were all abnormal by mitoswab plus, eight of the nine by mitoswab. Seven of the nine had a low complex one. That was the main finding. And that I see that in um, a lot of functional disorders like migraine, cyclic vomiting syndrome, chronic fatigue syndrome. Of course, these all overlap as I showed that a lot of patients will have more than one issue. And this is actually a copy and paste from one of them. This 100% would be the average for the median, that means half the people are below, half the people are above. Um, this is four times the median. That means there's a whole lot of mitochondria. There's a, bit, a little over four times the amount of mitochondrial activity than the average person, or say the median person. And the complex one is not down to zero. It's 17% of normal. You can see the 1.2 doesn't fit into the normal range. So this is sort of the normal thing that I see in chronic fatigue. There's almost always mitochondrial components. And that's been known for quite a while. Um, so, what about their outcomes? Okay, so you found genetic things, but did that translate to making them better? Um, I have, because whole genome hasn't been around for that long, um, many of these are patients I've seen fairly recently, um, I have outcome data as to how they've done in half of them, so of the nine, and a lot of this is relatively short. Um, all nine of them had some degree of improvement, and the degree varied from mild to profound. Some cases, the it, yeah, they're a little bit better. We can do a little bit more. But it's basically the same problems. To profound, the fatigue is completely gone and everywhere in between. I'd say the average is moderate improvement. They can now do more school, do more work, do groceries, do a little bit of housework or something, but they can't work full time and, and, and have a social life or something. So improvement varies tremendously and it varies on the amount. Fatigue is hard to treat. There's no doubt about that, but th it can be treated. Um, none of them got worse. That's good. Um, like I said, fatigue is hard to treat, and there's no, we don't have, quant we don't have numbers on this. We're planning to try to get the numbers. Um, my second case is also a 13-year-old girl. Um, she had developmental regression in the first grade and then recovered. They gave her kind of an autism diagnosis, but it was never really typical. Um, she had some auditory and visual processing delays that were noted, but it, she was in regular classes and doing schoolwork in, in English and math at grade level at the time. Um, she also had bad migraines um, and chronic pain in different places and um, chronic fatigue. And the chronic fatigue and the pain were her chief complaints when I saw her. Um, but then at 12 years of age, she got a respiratory virus, and she lost all of her skills. Like she was like an infant. She remember she was a normal 12 year old, and then she went down to being really infantile, almost catatonic, unable to speak, unable to do anything. Um, that improved a little bit um, to the point that she was doing first grade work. I'll show that, but um, she also had these weird seizure-like activities. Um, EEG never showed seizure, and she's had chronic infections, diagnosed with chronic variable immunodeficiency, treated with IVIG and high-dose steroids. So what about these seizure-like activities? Um, they were always preceded by headache, um, always with muscle weakness, and it was more on the left than on the right, often with ataxia, it's like a drunk would walk, high heart rate, pale, Urinary incontinence would, would pee in her pants. Um, it was clammy and often with nausea. Um, and people thought that, that this was, um, they didn't know what it was, and a lot of them thought that she was making it up or she had secondary gain or it was psychiatric or the parents had poisoned her. Or they you know, they, they um, thought about a whole bunch of different things. But anyway, these events are really pathognomonic. They're really for um, hemiplegic migraine, episodic ataxia. Um, prolonged episodes of headache, confusion, ataxia, and other neurological signs is what you see. Weakness is often symmetrical. Right is the same as the left side of the body in my experience, but asymmetrical weakness makes it even more of this. These are the three genes that are known to cause hemiplegic migraine. 
and these are the variants in her. She had a variant in all three of them, which probably explains why she has like the worst case I've ever seen of this condition. Um, and each of the variants are very rare in humans and rare in other species, meaning that's probably important amino acids in there. So she was put on a mitochondrial cocktail, potassium chloride, and a drug called acetazolamide, which changes salt balance. It's one of these water pills are used for um, altitude sickness. Um, her cognitive functioning had improved dramatically. When, before we started the treatment, um, in February 2020, her academics were at kindergarten level in reading and first grade in math. Um, and then in 2021, a year later, um, reading eighth grade, which is, she was in the, chronologically in the eighth grade and math the seventh grade. So she went from being, you know, way, way down, you know, seven, six to eight years behind to being essentially age appropriate. And then her behavior, which would have been very regressed, like infantile toddler, became a teenager again, which had its good and bad points about it. But anyway, um, her ataxia, the walking resolved, her POTS and anxiety improved dramatically. Yes, fatigue is hard to treat. The fatigue did get better. Um, and she can handle some school, but only a single class at a time. So her fatigue got better, her headache, um, she still has headache and she still has pain, but obviously she has improved dramatically. Okay, so I've already showed you this slide. Um, so these are, you know, the clinical diagnostic variants that, you know, this is the, the um, patient I just showed you here. Um, actually, this one here, these three here are the ones I just showed you. And then I showed you this one here with periodic paralysis earlier. They have the disease that's related to these mutations. So these are all presumably mutations that are disease related. And all of the green are in channel genes. And the blue is in a, cha a channel genes, ion ch channels, salt channels. And this is a salt pump. What are they? Um, they're channels that open up, let sodium one direction, potassium in the other direction. There are many, many sodium channels, many potassium channels, many um, um, calcium channel. So once the channel opens and the salt goes into the cell, how does it get back out? Well, it's got to be pumped out. Um, these pumps use energy to do that. Um, so you have, you have pumps which pump it so the salt is on one side of the membrane and then the channels open up so, and, the, and the ion, the salt rushes through. That's how nerves fire. That's how they send impulses. There, there's a gradient that, that the sodium is very, very much higher outside of the cell than it is inside the cell because of the pumps. So, and there's, the pumps are mostly exchange pumps. There are sodium potassium exchange pumps, there's sodium calcium exchange pumps, et cetera. Um, there's proton pumps that put acid in. There's all of these ones and that moves ca sodium in the other direction. But basically you pump it all where you want it to be. And when the nerve fires, the channels open and the ions rush through. So what ions are we talking about? Mostly the cations, which means positively charged, sodium, potassium, and, and calcium. What membranes? Mostly the outside, the plasma membrane, but also membranes within the cell as well. And ion channels are common causes of epilepsy, migraine, and cardiac conduction defects. That would be, um, that would be um, arrhythmias. So a lot of the things that I'm talking about are like weird types of migraine. Um, you can also channel opathies or abnormalities of ion channels can cause epilepsy as well as problems with heart conduction. So putting together um, the data of my 18 patients, a genetic cause was identified in 16 out of 18, and then there was one additional one of the possible cause. Um, ion channel genes, out of the 18 cases, 11 of them had an important variant in an ion channel. And eight of them had a diagnostic, just under half, um, variant in an ion channel. What about the rest of them? Seven of the 18 had an abnormality in the mitochondrial gene. So of the 18, either a channel gene or a mitochondrial gene was in 15 of the 18. What about the other three? They were problems with the immune system and inflammatory genes. Um, these overlap a little bit. And there was one that didn't have anything. That's the case I couldn't find anything. Um, mitochondrial dysfunction in all of them, 
regardless that the problem is the channel or mitochondria or inflammatory, they all the ones that tested had mitochondrial dysfunction. Um, the degree of improvement changed dramatically, but the improvement was generally associated with a comprehensive mitochondrial cocktail. And I'll get to what those are. Um, cases are polygenic. They're not caused by a single mutation in a single gene, but multiple variants and multiple genes plus environment. Um, here's important. The vast majority of these were not identified by the sequencing laboratory. That they were identified by me going through the sequence later. Um, I go through the raw data because I know which genes I'm looking for, and I'm looking for genetic changes that are not the pathogenic ones should be picked up by the lab, and most of them were. But the ones that are not pathogenic, th there's 40,000 variants in the average person, and if it's not pathogenic, the laboratory generally did not notice it. De novo variants are ones in which the parents don't have it, where there's significant neurodevelopmental disease, like, like um, intellectual disability, significant autism, there's usually a de novo variant. Um, and that requires trio sequencing, meaning you have to sequence the child, regardless what the age of the child can be an adult, and both parents as well, to find a de novo variant, to show that it's absent in the parents. Okay, um, so now I'm going to get to dietary supplementation. So we spoke about that mitochondrial dysfunction, which is the same as abnormal energy metabolism, that it is one of the things that's involved in MECFS, and my data shows the same. Inflammation, abnormal immunity is also known to be involved in that. Um, both of these can be treated with natural dietary supplementation. Yes, there are, there are medications that can affect the immune system. Um, and many of my patients are on those. They, have, they tend to have side effects on occasion, but sometimes they're necessary. But in addition, I put them on natural substances as well, which have less side effects. That um, to help the immune system out as much as we can. Mitochondrial dysfunction, there are no drugs on the market that will help with that. That's all dietary supplementation. Um, there are multiple dietary supplements that have been recommended in various sources. And you look at different sources and they say different things, but there's a core group that you see over and over again. The B vitamin complex, B1, 2, 3, 5, 6, 7, 9, and tw 12. Um, those eight B vitamins are what we call a B vitamin complex. Um, so they're all together, vitamin C, vitamin D, um, and then the, um, the salts, magnesium and zinc, the, those are also known as minerals, um, L-carnitine to, um, to help, and coenzyme Q10, both of these are detoxifiers to some degree, and then omega-3 essential fatty acids, and we'll talk about that later. So where is this information? Well, it's on my website. It's on the CDC website. The European Network also goes over it, and then I have here some exact um, articles that will talk about this. Those are all scientific studies. So busy slide. Again, it's all on the website. Um, the mitochondrial connection. I want to be clear about the fact this is not just me saying this in my data in nine patients that had mito swab, that this has been known and there's a lot of data out there. It's not that surprising that a deficiency in your, of energy in your life can be due to a deficiency of energy at the cellular level. It kind of makes sense. Um, the vast majority of energy in our bodies is made by the mitochondria and cellular energy deficiency is often referred to as mitochondrial dysfunction. Optimal mitochondrial function depends on all of these vitamins, minerals, and other things like carnitine and coenzyme Q10. Um, when energy metabolism is not working right, it causes all those things that I mentioned on the Vitruvian man. In particular, it can cause neurodevelopmental problems like autism or ADHD. It can cause chronic pain, um, GI problems, fatigue, um, also um, anxiety, depression, dysautonomia, and many other things. Um, pr progressive physicians that just to say, oh, you have fatigue or there's nothing wrong with you or it's psychiatric or why don't you want to go to work? But the physicians that really work on this and really try to treat this, they've been advocating mitochondrial tr um, therapies for this disease for decades now. Um, mitochondrial cocktail refers to all of the stuff together. A whole, a, it's no alcohol in it. Alcohol is actually a mitotoxin. Um, this is people have asked before. I've had kids say, but I don't drink alcohol. 
So a mito cocktail are things mixed together. And when I'm talking about a mito cocktail, I'm talking about at least these here. Usually the CoQ and omega-3s are given as separate because they, the powders and the oils don't mix physically. They don't work very well in the same product. But you're talking about the eight B vitamins, vitamin C, vitamin D, magnesium, zinc, carnitine, at least. And there's many other ones as well. Um, and dietary supplementations, yes, they can. If you have a dietary deficiency because of eating the wrong foods, supplementation can wipe out that deficiency. That's true. But that's not the main reason for it. The main reason for it is to give the mitochondria extremely high doses of key vitamins and minerals and antioxidants to push it in the direction of making more energy and more importantly to detoxify it because the mitochondria is not working very well. It makes a lot of free radicals, reactive oxidant species, and those damage DNA, they damage membranes, they damage proteins, etc. And we need to detoxify the mitochondria. And there's many things that will do that. Um, the antioxidants, carnitine, CoQ, all do that. So um, the mito cocktail um, in I generally recommend energy needs. This is something I put together for, for adults because it has capsules. Um, for the adult dose, anyone over um, 60 kilograms, which is about 133 pounds, I recommend five in the morning, five in the evening. But you don't start with that. You start with one and one and work your way up over a couple of weeks or so. Um, take it with a meal at least at first. This has 40 active ingredients in it. And then for kids or anyone who wants to have a powder, um, it could be mixed in, it in, in any amount of liquid, in any liquid you want. Um, cold juices are often what people will do. But you can mix it in anything. Smoothie is another thing. It comes in lemon or in berry flavor. The, all of the things that are common in CoQ, that are common in, um, for chronic fatigue syndrome, are in these. So eight B vitamins, vitamin C, vitamin D, magnesium, L-carnitine, and then there's some CoQ, but we'll get to that later. Also, there are two things that are sometimes recommended that some sites suggest alpha lipoic acid and selenium for coenzyme for I'm um, sorry for chronic fatigue syndrome, and they're in both of these as well. So again, the difference is between powder and capsules. This is a little cheaper because it's an adult dose for a or an, it's a month dose for an adult versus a month dose for a child, so it contains more, even though the unit price is slightly less. I mean, slightly more. Sorry. Um, I do recommend this for anyone who can swallow, but if you can't swallow or if that's a difficult, this is a good, um, this is good as well. Um, both of these products include all of the above listed components as well as many additional ones targeted to mitochondria and it operates as a multivitamin. Um, that it has, so you don't need to take additional vitamins on top of that. Um, and then there's the caveats, you know, they're designed to be safe for everyone, but check with your physician, particularly if you have a medical condition. And um, you, it doesn't mean you can eat really, really horrible and take these and be okay. You, you, you got to tend to your diet as well. Okay, CoQ. I have scientific studies here that show that CoQ is important in chronic fatigue syndrome. CoQ is perhaps the most important, in my opinion, of the different things. Um, many chronic conditions, especially if you have mitochondrial dysfunction, you get CoQ deficiency. But CoQ is also an incredibly good antioxidant to remove the pro-oxidant parts of a bad mitochondrial metabolism. Um, I try to get the blood levels higher than four, which normal is a less than, normal is like 0.6 to 1.4, so I like sky high levels um, to be, and I find that people get much better on that. Um, for, over, for about two decades, I was telling people to go over the counter and buy it. And I was telling people what some of the good ones were, but people would find something that was cheaper. And the cheap stuff are really garbage. They don't have the right type of CoQ in it. And they don't, they have Ubiquin own in it, which is cheaper. Yes, it's, it's, it's half the price. But it, right here, Ubiquin own but it's five times less bioavailable. You need five times more of it. So this is twice the price, but you need 150 amount. Make sure it says ubiquinol. If it doesn't say ubiquinol, see here, then it, it's not that, it's the cheap stuff. And even the ubiquinol products varied a lot. Blood levels varied between brands. So I went ahead and private labeled my own QNEADS, um, which is a really good brand at a good price because I know that it works for my patients, but there are other good ubiquinols out there. 
And it comes in gel capsules, and you can see the size of the gel capsules. Um, one of the things in it, it's not in soy oil like most of them are. It's in limonene oil, which is the oil of lemon peel. Um, it tends to be absorbed better, and you don't get some of the problems you get with soy. Some people are allergic to soy. Okay, so I always do recommend to take the CoQ on top of it, but I also recommend omega 3s. Why are they not in my, my Mito products? Because these are oils and they don't mix with the powders. The powder's in the capsules, or the powder, the spectrum needs powder. Um, it's, just, it's just a physical problem, they just don't mix. Um, so multiple anomalies of the immune system have been reported in um, chronic fatigue, and I mentioned some of those. Um, chronic fatigue syndrome often starts after a common illness like Epstein-Barr, mononucleosis, mycoplasma, influenza, Lyme, or something else. And a lot of people think that it's damaged due to an overactive immune system reacting to the common infection. Um, many of the same progressive physicians have noticed that if you give, if you treat inflammation, that you help with the symptoms. So if there's an inflammatory component, you can treat inflammation with old drugs like um, ibuprofen or naproxen. Some people use that. A lot of people use that. There are more powerful drugs that will do that. But there's also natural supplements that can be helpful with that. Um, and a lot of people, a lot of physicians and a lot of people would prefer to use the natural supplements first and then use medications if they still have additional problems with inflammation. So omega-3 um, fatty acids are an excellent source of um, anti-inflammatory. They're also really good for brain growth and they're, they're good for mitochondrial function and many other things. And a lot of people take omega-3s for good health in general. Most people that take omega freeze take fish oil. Fish oil is great. It's good for your hair, your skin, your nails. It's good for your heart, your blood pressure, your blood sugar. It's great for all of that. And you can use very high doses from some brands. And it really helps your body for a reasonable price. But it doesn't get into the brain. The fish oil needs to be converted to a phospholipid by the liver to get into the brain. And you can give tons of fish oil, and it's great for the heart. Heart will love you, but it, only a little bit's getting to the brain because the liver will only convert a little. So some people, like particularly the ADHD community, they'll use um, krill oil because krill oil is phospholipid bound. It goes directly into the brain. And that's great. But krill oil um, is much more expensive, and to use the dosing that will help your heart would be hundreds of dollars a month. So a lot of people will take a krill oil product, and a fish oil product. Um, I went ahead, and my affected child was on both of those, but um, I went ahead and blended them together. I also put phosphatidylserine in there, which is another phospholipid that's helpful for the brain. That comes from sunflower seed oil. So this is a mixture of krill and fish and sunflower seed. And it's offered at a price which is comparable to what you can just get from krill or to fish alone. Um, so with the advantages of this for the mitochondria, it has axaxanthin, which is a um, antioxidant. Um, has high or it has high omega threes for the body, um, and it has the krill oil, which goes directly into the brain, and the phosphatidylserine. It's all in here. Um, my next case is a nine-year-old boy, um, and he started complaining about fatigue at six years. It's not very common for six-year-olds to complain of fatigue. They usually bounce off the walls. He was always tired, and the family life was completely based around his fatigue. What they can do. And if they overdid it, he had post-exertional fatigue for days. Um, when you talk to the family, fatigue was the major part. It really completely dictated their life. But if you talk to the boy, he would say, there's fireworks in my foot, um, like a, which he wasn't able to explain any better than that. But it's probably some electrical, like um, pens and needles type thing that you can see with this mutation. Um, that was the chief complaint particularly as the fatigue got much better with treatment, that became the big one. And he had migraine with aura, some GI issues as well. And then you can see there's other problems here. Lots of other problems. This kid's only nine. He has some learning disabilities and some high-functioning autism, but he's actually quite high-functioning. Mito swab showed mitochondrial proliferation, um, decreased complex one, and then the plus part showed also a very low complex too. So this is kind of, this is a common pattern of mitochondrial dysfunction for chronic fatigue. Um, but here, I want to mention his limb pain. They would last for minutes up to two hours, 
happen twice a week, often the day after exertion. So if he went, if he exercised too much, like just walking one block, he would have pins and needles type in pain, like a, fireworks in his legs um, for up to a couple hours the next day. Um, and they were in a particular part of his left leg. Nothing makes it better. Numbness occurs with the pain a lot of the times and the leg looked completely normal. So nobody can find it. And of course they x-rayed it and MRI'd it and everything like that and they didn't find anything wrong with it. But he has a mutation in the sodium 9A channel gene. This is a sodium channel gene. It's known as a nociceptive. That means that for pain, re, um, the reception of pain, the perception of pain, sodium channel in pain fibers. And it causes paroxolamines from time to time or occasional extreme pain disorder, which is really what he had. Um, the older patients are usually diagnosed with a small fiber neuropathy. Um, Sometimes you can have redness and heat on the skin, but sometimes you don't. Most of the time I've seen that you don't. You get, um, if, you, if both of these genes are knocked out completely, loss of function, that means the sodium channel doesn't work, you get congenital insensitivity to pain. You can't feel pain at all. But if one of these has a leak that's a gain of function, then you have too much pain. And, that's, um, and the fatigue improved in the mitochondrial cocktail dramatically, started him on Cymbalta, um, and um, I haven't seen him back for follow-up yet. I hope he's gotten better. Um, I see a lot of um, 9A patients and 10A patients um, have very similar problems, and they usually get better with Cymbalta, and if that doesn't work, I use Gabapentin. If that doesn't work, I use Amitriptyline or Zoloft. Um, so all of this can be done with sodium 9A. The fatigue, the pain, the GI, always cold frequent urinations, palpitations. But the hemiplegia that he has, hypotonia that's being floppy, tremor, his, his arms would go like that. Um, ADHD, autism, and learning disability, those are not part of sodium 9A. And what I found was, remember I said if you have um, neurodevelopmental diseases, often a de novo variant not found in the patient, this is a pathogenic variant that's de novo, it's a frame shift, it destroys the protein. Um, it's in a gene which turns on other genes in mitochondrial metabolism. Um, and people that have it have neurodevelopmental disease, hypotony and tremor, which is really what he has. This is a perfect fit here. Again, polygenic. One, one gene mutation contributes to a lot of it the other gene mutation contributes to other stuff. Okay, so remember I said most of the diagnostic variants were not identified by the laboratory. Um, functional symptomatology is really not treated seriously by physicians or researchers or by that matter family members or employers. Um, it's like suck up or it's you know, that you are a drug user if you're older, or it's Munchausen by proxy if you're younger, or you're acting up if you're in between. Um, I've seen many patients that were taken away from their, ch from the child was taken away because they didn't believe it was real. Um, it's, it's just that there's very little research in functional symptomatology, pain, fatigue, dizziness, nausea. And it's very unfortunate. Um, genetics is complex because it's polygenic. Um, comorbidities, that's things you see as well. They're critical, and sometimes the comorbidities are, are even worse or, or more treatable. Pain, including the legs and migraine, weakness, fevers, all sorts of things. And then the neurogenomic service that I've set up that's really set to do this is to look at somebody who has the type of conditions that we've discussed here. Pain, fatigue, dysautonomia, um, nausea, dizziness. Um, and to look at the genes, the raw data, in a polygenic functional medicine model to find mutations or sequence variants that can really help and with the entire emphasis on finding things that can help with treatment. And it's done by telehealth, telemedicine, Zoom, or whatever. Um, so um, if you're interested in the things that we've spoken about here, um, again, the, you know, the, I, am a mem I am one of the founders of NeuroNeeds. Um, 
And so the conflict of interest, of course, and this is talk is given by neuro needs. But I really strongly recommend if you can swallow to take energy needs, it has the 40 active ingredients, it's a very high powered mitochondrial cocktail. And at least to start with that, but if you're dead serious, you can buy what's called the brain bundle and you can buy all three of these together for a decreased cost. It adds the additional CoQ and the omega needs, the fish, the krill, and the sunflower seed. Um, and to take all three of those together. It takes about two months to really notice a major change, two to three months. Some people will notice things after a few weeks or even a few days, some people after a month, but you really need two to three months because let's say that you took the magic pill and your problem went away immediately. Well, the nerves now need to heal. And after they heal, they need to reattach themselves in the correct way. It just takes time. Um, it's not gonna be like you give ibuprofen and within 15 minutes you feel better or the stuff is useless. It really, it takes time. Um, so keep that in mind and you work, you start low, you work your way up and then, you know, it takes about a couple months on full dosing. So the three things that I wanted to mention here is that chronic fatigue syndrome, um, it's a real condition. It's relatively common and it's generally disabling. Abnormal energy metabolism and inflammation are associated with it and then natural supplements are safe and often effective. And here is my information. If you're interested in NeuroNeeds, that you can go to the NeuroNeeds website, just neuroneeds.com will do it. And then this is if you're interested in the DNA testing um, component or just have questions. Um, you can ask questions about clinical care and about DNA testing to go to this one here. And um, that's the website and that's the email. Liz, L-I-Z, she's the coordinator. Um, used to be Lori, but Lori's now doing bigger and better things, and I have Liz. And um, this is the Neuro Needs website. And if you have any questions, we will be happy to answer the questions. So I'll leave this on there for anybody that wants to copy these down. And thank you. Okay, hey, thank you, Dr. Bowles. Um, so now I'm going to go to the chat and we can answer some of your questions. One moment. Okay. Here we go. Um, has there been any work with homeopathy or biofeedback to try to alter gene expressions? Uh, you know, okay. Homeopathy, I don't know. Um, biofeedback, um, I've seen some patients get better. Some patients hasn't made a difference in a couple that have gotten worse. Um, it does change things. Um, it's certainly something to consider. Um, but um, I don't know if anyone's looked at it in terms of gene expression, but in terms of clinical improvement. Okay. Uh, can one try flaxseed oil for omega-3s? I'm having trouble with fish oil supplements. Um, well, flaxseed oil, um, I mean, honestly, I don't know if it's, if it's um, a phospholipid or a triglyceride. I'd have to look that up. Um, if it's a phospholipid, it'll go directly to the brain, and that might be something that's useful. If it's not, then you would have the same issue with with a, a fish oil supplement. You could always mix krill and flaxseed together. Um, I don't know what the issues were with the with the fish oil. If the problem was taste, um, getting a child to swallow capsules will work, and there are some that have better taste than others. And then there are some capsules that you open the container and it just smells like fish. And there are other capsules, including ours, that you can smell it all day long. And you don't smell any fish. It's really <laughs> inside the cap. So. Okay. Um, are neuro needs supplements okay for people with homozygous MTHFR mutations? They are designed for people with any genotype or phenotype. And yes, there isn't anything in there that would be completely incompatible with that. Um, there are two different mutations, and homozygous, I assume that's homozygous at one of the alleles and not at the other. Those people generally do okay. If you're homozygous at both alleles, you may want to make sure you take the capsules because the B vitamins are pretty high in the powder. Um, supplements for small fiber neuropathy. Um, most of my patients, when they are biopsied, have small fiber neuropathy. Most of what I spoke about will work for that. I don't okay. biopsy them because it's, I know they're going to have it, but yeah. Uh, this isn't really a question, but she says, 
Um, my son is doing great on the brain bundle, started spectrum needs and Q needs two years ago, krill four, month, four months ago. Thank you. That's, good that's, that's, that's encouraging. Uh, this one. Okay. Uh, a lot of people thanking you, <laughs> saying that you help their children. Um, oh, you're welcome. <laughs> uh, are there any other additional supplements or vitamins if you take NeuroNeeds products? Ah, I, I, I was 57 minutes and that's one of the things I had to cut out. Um, <laughs> everyone's an individual and I use these products as a platform to build an individual treatment protocol for every individual that deserves, you know, individual treatment. They all need omega foods. You all need CoQ. You all need mitochondria. You all need, you know, micronutrition, vitamins and minerals. A lot of patients, they get more magnesium too. Magnesium is useful for many, many different things, including if you have constipation or somebody who's having um, problems sleeping or anxiety or headache, particularly migraine. A lot of times I give more magnesium. Um, B vitamins. I tried to keep the B vitamins at a relatively low level. They're, they're moderate. They're not sky high and they're not, you know, like a multivitamin over the counter that are low in these products so that you would be okay with MTHFR and with other common mutations. But some people need sky high B vitamins. And so you'd want to take a B complex on top of it. Um, some people need more zinc. Um, mm -hmm. Some people need more carnitine. I get blood level levels. If it, some people need more vitamin D, I get blood levels to see if you need that. I get, you know, I get blood levels of carnitine, CoQ, vitamin D, potassium and magnesium. Those are the ones I get, and a lot of times people will need more. So that's carnitine, coenzyme Q10, vitamin D, that's 25 hydroxy vitamin D, magnesium, usually an RBC magnesium, and a complete blood, a comprehensive metabolic panel, which includes potassium, sodium, and all calcium and all that. Those are the things I usually get. And then I and then if they're low, I'll increase something. Occasionally, something is high, we can reduce something. Okay, um, we, I think we have time for one more question. Um, this lady, her, she says her child's doing well on spectrum needs, but her biggest issue lately is continued and drawn out viral illnesses, taking weeks to recover from common colds. Yeah, um, yeah, that's not uncommon. Um, first of all, is that it could be mitochondrial dysfunction, significant mitochondrial dysfunction that you get in mitochondrial disease. It could be another metabolic disease. It could be chronic variable immunodeficiency, which is really hard to diagnose, and a lot of doctors poo-poo it, just like a lot of the stuff they do. Um, there's many different possibilities there, so you really kind of have to get down to the underlying issue on that. I hate sequestering kids like they did in the pandemic for their whole life because they get sick all the time. Um, I try to figure out what the problem is and deal with it. There are supplements that can help with immunity. I give more zinc sometimes because of that. It's a lot of vitamin C in my products. There's a lot of zinc in my products, but sometimes I give more. Um, mm -hmm. There's another antioxidant called NAC or N-acetylcysteine that you can buy over the counter. And it's an excellent antioxidant for people that have significant mitochondrial dysfunction. I didn't put it in my products because about one in four people get so much nausea they can't take it. And I wanted my products to be at least almost everyone to be tolerated in. Um, but a lot of my patients, maybe up to half of them, I give them NAC um, in addition to the products. Um, so that would be another thing that you can add. Um, what dose? I start with 500 once a day and I work up to 1,000. So 500 times two twice a day for anyone that's like 10 years or older, 12 or older, somewhere in that area. Um, uh, for school age kids, about half of that. Okay. All right. Um, well, you guys can continue to ask questions in the chat and um, I can go in and try to answer them later. Uh, thank you, Dr. Bowles, for uh, giving us this wonderful lecture. And it will be up on YouTube later today for anyone who missed it or would like to replay it and um, look back on the information that was shared. So thank you, Dr. Bowles. It's on the website too, in case if you want to look at, uh, to see the proof behind all of that. Um, so um, I don't want to say anything unless I can back it up.